Here we're taking a look at the PLX Compact 1 to 8 by 24 first focal plane and rifle scope from Primary Arms. This is their compact and lightweight platinum series, the PLX they're calling it. Okay, uh, it's a lot more low profile than the 34 millimeter scopes, but it has much the same performance of the bigger tube scope. Um, it's very, very light compared to the other scope as well. This is out of Light Optics in Japan. Light Optic Works in Japan produces a lot of your top-notch rifle scopes for a lot of big companies that you would know pretty well. Night Force, for example, uses that factory quite a bit, right? Like, I think that's where a lot of the parts are coming from. Also, Leupold and Vortex and most of the higher-end Japanese rifle scopes are coming out of either that factory or a different one that's over there, okay? And uh, they produce really good optics. I heard through the grapevine that this particular scope this primary arms one to eight compact that they made for primary arms it has a different control group and some other technologies being employed to make it very lightweight but yet very reliable and they were saying that according to light optic works and this is just what i heard through the grapevine might not be true i don't know but the, a lot of guys there were saying this is the most state-of-the-art one they've made at that place yet so this is an advancement in technology. Um, I would concur based on what I see from what my use has been thus far. Now, I know that a lot of other guys came out with reviews a lot quicker than I did, but I'm, I, when it comes to new technology, okay, uh, like this is a lot of new technology here. I'm, man, I like to get my, my time behind it before I can know if I like it or not, right? So this one I've been using for a while. I'll tell you what, the configuration of this particular optic is ideal, in my opinion, for a jack of all trades, Swiss army knife AR type setup, okay? Um, when you get down to one power, it's very, very, very true. Um, is it exactly quantifiably exactly one power? Mm, I don't know about that because it depends on uh, what you're, you know, what you're defining as absolutely right on. But practically, it's one power. Uh, works very good. It's very, very what they call an extra wide field of view. So when you get behind it, it's like a really forgiving eye box. You see a lot. Um, there's a lot of ways guys describe that in the industry. I'll just tell you in my colloquial terms, when you have this thing on a lower power, even at a higher power, uh, the, the wide field of view, when you lift it up, it's right there immediately. It's forgiving with eye relief. And the picture I see, it's um, very similar to what you'd experience in a 34 millimeter tube. And this is a 30 millimeter scope, which also gives you a, be a better uh, selection of a lot of different lightweight ring mounts and rings and mounts. Like this one is actually the primary arms platinum mount that I've been trying, and I like it. It's actually a very stout mount. 
Um, the stylistically, it's nice. It's got a low footprint, but the specs on this mount, I did a review on this mount. Look up the specs and you'll understand why the price tag is where it's at. It's uh, a very nicely made mount. Watch the review on Rex Reviews on that deal. Getting back to the optic here, uh, they do have a throw lever available that comes with this. So you can do your quick, you know, you can just turn it if you got mittens on in the winter time, right? You just kind of grab it and it's easy to find. You can fold it down. I have found that if you're on a lower power, like I carry it around sometimes on one power, it's knurled, which is nice, but it's snaggy and it'll catch on your, your coat and it'll deploy it and do stuff like that. If you have it set at about four power, it's in this position now like this. So if you're carrying it on your person like this, it's above, so it's gonna snag less. And if you have it on eight power, carry, carrying it around on eight power, if that ever happened for some reason, uh, it would be on this side, okay? So it'd be on the side, if you're carrying uh, right-handed. Now, if you're carrying left-handed, invert that, okay? Uh, this thing uh, has this, I mean, stylistically, it has the, the very fine knurled magnification ring texture. The uh, grip on it is actually very effective. It's very, very grippy, and it kind of has... I don't remember what era that would have been. Maybe the late 90s or early 2000s. There was a lot of the Primo scopes of those days, the customized scopes. This kind of reminds me of a throwback to that style. Like some of the stuff that you'd see on other uh, top-notch brands would have that same kind of knurling. Functionally, it's it's nice. It's not real high profile, um, but it's definitely very aggressive, okay? Um, you also have the same texture on your illumination. By the way, the illumination on this is very nice, kind of geared. There's always different applications which would dictate what way you wanna build the illumination on a scope. This one has the Chevron illuminated and the horseshoe. It doesn't have your BDC information illuminated. This is the ACSS reticle in here, which I'll show you in a little bit, but it doesn't illuminate that. It just illuminates the center point and that's for kind of moving that Venn diagram of use more towards when it's illuminated for fast shooting, right? So if you're doing quick stuff, you can get up on target real quick and it pops at you even on one power. Uh, it's just like, kind of like a red dot. Um, I mean, not exactly, but it just as quick. So let's get back up on there. You're definitely gonna see it. It's bright, um, plenty bright. Guys argue about brightness. I don't think a lot of them guys really know what they're talking about in terms of functional use on some of those deals, but that's for a, for a different day. For all actual reality and all functionality, uh, the illumination is effective. It works fine. Um, you know, guys talk about bleed over. There is a little bit on, this is one of the prototypes. This is one of the first ones. I think they corrected that. There is some bleed over on my prototype here, okay? Um, but it's, is that going to screw you up? Like if I totally close it off here, I can see the splash of it onto some of the other stuff. Is that a functional deal? Mm, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, it does have, we'll get in the reticle in a minute, but one of the things that I do really, really like about it, besides it being very compact and extremely lightweight, okay. We have covered turret caps for a low power variable optic. Covered caps will save its life. So it's, it fell seven feet onto the optic and then stuff piled on it. And it does look like we do have, uh, I don't know if you can see it on camera, but it hit here and it hit on the ring over here. And so if this thing would have had exposed turrets where you have, for example, you know, like where you have the, you slip the scales and you have your little tiny screws attached to the inner post and you turn it. That's where you break those deals. But having a covered cap is extremely nice for someone carrying the rifle around a lot where you might have stuff happen, right? Plus, you can put this on there so you don't snag anything. Now, look at how low profile these turret caps are. Very low profile turret caps. I'm not going to mess with this too much because I got it zeroed now. Um, I can show you on the video, but um, very low profile. You can slip the scales on those. There are very tiny little screws in here, um, but they're very reliable. They have a very positive 
tactile click sensation. It does feel, they are, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, stainless steel mechanisms of the control group. And you can feel that. They're very precise, kind of like a Swiss watch, or in this case, a Japanese watch. Um, I did my comprehensive testing of how the turrets performed. They have very reliable uh, tracking and they are functional all the way to the extremity of the adjustment range. You don't have like at the ends of the range on some of the other scopes, even in this price range sometimes, you, what you'll see is you'll see clicking when they get to the edge, the movement bottoms out, but they continue clicking. So you think you're moving and you're not. Now you think your barrel's bad. Now you think the ammo's crazy. Now you think there's something wrong with you. Oh, the wind increased by 40 miles an hour. Let's crank some more and it's not moving. This doesn't have that. I tracked it from one extreme end of the picture to the other. And I did that on purpose blurry. If you want the scientific actual engineering results, I'll share that next for my patrons on Patreon, where I'll show you kind of like what it came up with in terms of quantified performance. But it did very well in terms of reliability. Uh, the tracking precision was good within the, the most part of the adjustment range. At the very extremities, the click started shortening up a little bit, but that's pretty common in a Japanese three-piece design. You're gonna see that in scopes that are two, three thousand dollars um, in that design typically, okay? So, but the main parts have been corrected in terms of like, if, it, if it's clicking, it is still moving, even though they shorten up a, a tiny bit. Now, the use of this optic, what you're gonna do is get it dialed in, right? Like I have my elevation, right? I'm gonna get it all dialed in, and then you're gonna put the cap on so nobody screws it up. So that if it's, you're pulling it out of the bag or you're wearing it on your back, you get it cinched up, you're climbing, doing some stuff, and you're moving and you're doing other stuff, doing your transition drills, right? Uh, what you're gonna see is like, oh, there's a cap on there. Ancient technology for ancient reasons, man. Very, very good idea to have a cap, especially for a rifle like this that you're gonna use. It is threaded in the front right here. And I was told by two people when I checked that yes, they are planning on having an anti-reflection device available for this optic. I hope that's true because that is a big plus for a lot of applications. You get water, you get blowing snow, there's, you get the surf, like if you're on a Mare Ops team or something, right? That actually does help a bit, like if you're in the splashing water. Um, and also for what it says, anti-reflection device, you can ask guys that do that stuff for a job. They'll say, yeah, we actually use those things in real life, right? Um, maybe not on a flat range, but those guys use them. Um, they will be coming with that is what I was told. So that's pretty cool. Look at how short it is though. I mean, I don't know if you guys can see that. I can you see my eyeballs here? Look at how short that is. And the weight is very light. I will read you the specs. Yes, I printed them off. I didn't memorize the specs exactly for you. I know uh, that it's very compact and lightweight. Uh, the battery type for the illumination, by the way, is a 2032, right? So those are very highly available. It does have um, a shake awake feature, right? So like when it's sleeping, it's like the, you turn go like this and it turns it on. It'll save your battery life. It'll actually, back in the old days when they didn't have that kind of feature, these, these batteries would go dead all the time, at least for me. Like by the, all right, we're gonna use the battery. Now you'd have to change it before each deal because you didn't know if it was bad or not. But it does take 2032s, which makes it easy to run there. Click values, this is a Milrad click system here. So it's a 0.1 mils per click, right? Very standard. Exit pupil diameter is uh, eight millimeters on low uh, power and three millimeters on high power. So you got the exit pupil diameters, how, like what's the, the collimation of the light coming out of here? of the back end of the scope, right? Uh, the field of view on its low setting is 121 feet, okay? And it's at 100 yards. And on its maximum power and eight power, it is 14.6 feet, okay? First focal plane illuminated 29, or excuse me, 9.28 inches long, very compact. Uh, nine, just a little over nine, nine inches long. It is night vision compatible. Uh, the objective lens is 24 millimeters. That's what that means when it says one to eight by 24. The 24 is the millimeters of the objective lens, okay? And it performs like a larger diameter lens. It's nice glass. Uh, Light Optic Works does a very good job with that. 
Um, it does have, this one has the ACSS Raptor M8. They are coming out with the Griffin Mill version, I think. I don't know when, probably pretty soon. Uh, it's a BDC type reticle. Uh, total elevation and windage adjustments are 100 minutes of angle, approximately, right? And the diameter is 20, and the weight is 16.95 ounces. 16 ounces, guys. Pretty light compared to their other stuff in the Platinum series. The 1 to 8s are significantly heavier in the 34 millimeter tubes. And I always thought, man, I got a couple right here. Well, let me grab it real quick for you. Yep. <clears throat> Compact Platinum. They're like, yeah, and they're light too. So here is the 1 to 8 Platinum on my little Zion here, okay? And it's a lot heavier, okay? Now, if you're weightlifting or doing flat range stuff, it's not a big deal. But if you are humping this rifle and carrying it in the mountains with other stuff, ounces make pounds. There's a reason they say that. And even tough army guys will tell you, they're the ones that'll actually tell you that weight is actually a criteria, right? So this is pretty stout, but it's still manageable. I love this scope. It's awesome. The one to eight uh, platinum 34 millimeter. This one right here, see if we can get them. It's a bit small, right guys? See if I can go like this. You can see it's a, it's a, the footprint is a lot more manageable than the one to eight platinum in the 34 millimeter tube. It is lighter, it is a bit lighter, which I think is absolutely worth a little more coin for sure. Um, and the, the, I mean, the footprint is considerably smaller. Uh, the 34 millimeter version is still nice. It does have the lockable turrets that are adjustable. I actually prefer the caps for this application. I actually prefer that. Um, because it protects this when it when you drop it on stuff. Um, on a model like this, you have those intricate screws and mechanisms that pop out that can get knocked. And that can, that's if it's going to fail, that's a very common place you'll see that. Okay, let's get into the reticle, okay? I'll show you the reticle. And yes, this rifle is black now. Um, it's just in the normal finish. But uh, I think I'm going to marry this scope to this rifle and we'll probably rattle can it like all the rest, right? Put a ring on it, get it married up. So here's the ACSS, what do they call it? The M8 Raptor that they have available in this particular rifle. This is my favorite of the Raptor reticles so far. We have the ring, which is nicely proportioned, okay? Uh, we have the chevron and you can see in red there, that's the part that's illuminated. This is on, actually this is, I don't know if this is an accurate representation of exactly where uh, what you'd see for field of view at eight power. I think you see more than that. But um, we have our moving target dots here, okay? This is basically a slow target, medium speed target, and a fast target, right? Pretty simple, you can look up the specs. This is geared approximately for a typical combatant with a full loadout running, you know, full speed at 8.6 miles an hour. Is that gonna happen in real life exactly? No, but you have reference points, right? So we have our running targets here, okay? We have a Chevron, and we have 400 meters, 500, 600, 700, 800, okay? So the four, six, and eight are labeled. In between there, we have 500 meters. That's where you hold at 500 meters when you zero here at 100, the way it's designed, right? We do have halfway marks between those as well, and you'll see these dots going to the side, wind dots. So if you got a five mile an hour wind, you hold on the first dot. 15 10, uh, and 20. So 5, 10, 15, and 20, right? So we have uh, wind dots in five mile per hour increments. And this is calibrated for the 5.56 five, and 62 grain uh, SS109 or M855 uh, bullets, okay? Um, very effective. It works good. Like, very easy to get someone used to shooting this thing without explaining ballistic science to them. All they have to know is that the wind pushes a bullet one way, one, you know, and the other way. So like, look at the wind, how much is it? Hold on that dot and you're gonna be really close. Second shot is easy, right? Very easy to get people uh, squared away on this reticle in terms of most of your basic functions. There's some advanced stuff that might, the Griffin Mill would probably do better at, right? Um, we do have the horizontal stadia here. This is your 
auto stadiometric ranging, auto ranging optically, which in a lot of ways is superior to your lasers. And as they're finding out now that they're exiting the G-Watt situation, a lot of your professionals are going back to the old guys. They always made fun of me for telling people stadiometric ranging, mill dots, man, you got to know how to do that because like when you're coming up against a near peer adversary, they can see your lasers. They're going to know you're there. So you can just, and they can still see optics if they're really well outfitted, right? But this is a big deal. Um, being able to very quickly inside the reticle, you have multiple things you can do with the optic. Now, you don't have to carry a rangefinder around if you're measuring the targets, but you simply bracket your target in here, and they're set for two legged critters, and you can see how far they are. So, 800 if he's this tall, uh, 600, 400, right? Pretty cool. And so, there you have. Also, uh, part of the Raptor is the width here on the Stadia lines where you hold over for your. 400, if it's shoulder to shoulder fits in that line, that's where I aim. Shoulder to shoulder here, see how they get smaller? And for the first few, it works good out to about 600, okay? And then past that, um, it's too small, so they just kept it normal. But out to 600, you can immediately range shoulder to shoulder or height stadiometrically without emitting electromagnetic radiation on the battlefield, which is not good. When you back off on this reticle, You'll notice that it becomes, this shrinks down, right? And you got a little dot in the middle with your chevron in the middle. And then you have these horizontal and vertical uh, stadia lines that continue out and they're marked. So now you have a traditional crosshair kind of deal surrounding your center ACSS Raptor features, which is awesome. I've always wanted that for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, a big part, if you'll watch on our Patreon uh, channel, uh, the instructions we have on low power variable optics from my bro saw does an amazing job at that. He's got a lot of experience using those against bad guys, right? Uh, he expounds on the importance of the optic of, uh, as being an observation tool even more than you use it for pulling the trigger. Like in the real role, you use it for explaining where stuff is to your buddy. And it's nice having all those markings going out to the sides and top because when you're doing target reference point systems like we talked about on the 101 series, the Sniper 101, right? TRPs, man. Like, okay, 47 mils to the right of that stump that we both identified in the grass. That's, there's nothing around it. Like 47 mils this way and three mils down. Look there. I think there's something there. Communication tool, man. Got to have those, you got to have those markings if you want to be able to, is way better than ballpark. Ah, you know, kind of to the left. Sort of past the bush, but not really. Quantifying your communication and your spacing is huge. So that's a really, really big upgrade in features in the reticle as well that I think are awesome. Which by itself, just the reticle by itself. I, I just switch over to this all of a sudden. Like, it's, it's nice. So I like it a lot. Like, I'm, I'm excited about it legitimately. If I wasn't, I would pretty much tell you, right? Be like, oh, it's all right. This is a really, really nice scope, nice setup, lightweight. You got your turret caps. You got your ARD potentially coming in the future. I don't know if it's here, comment in the commentary, like if you guys see the ARD yet, okay? Uh, whenever that shows up, I'm gonna grab them and I'm gonna try to get more of these. Um, so we have the covered turret caps. We have the better reticle, right? We have the lightweight. It's very compact, the ARD. I mean, those are upgrades, significant upgrades on the PLX line for sure. Smaller, sweeter, more efficient. Very cool. So check it out. Um, if you want to grab one of these deals, I got discount uh, codes. Uh, I think it's like Rex. You type in the Rex deal. Maybe it's Rex 10. I'll leave the exact current discount code because they evolve a little bit over time in the description below and in the commentary. So if you can't find it, click around a little more and you'll find that. That does help support the channel. And thank you to Primary Arms for allowing me to check these deals out. They're actually pretty, pretty nice series of scopes. The uh, PLX, that's what I have on pretty much my go-to systems, like all my carbines and stuff like that. That's what I run, okay? I have other, I have lots of other stuff too, guys. I'm not like brand loyal to any specific brand, but there's a reason I like those. The ACSS reticle, pushes it over the edge every time, in my opinion. They're decent, well-made scopes with a really, really effective reticle. Good combo. All right, 
Hopefully that was entertaining. If not helpful, we'll catch you on the next one, guys. Rex out.